right, I took a little break there. This is part two of an article that I read recently on a Facebook post. Um, and it's from, where did I read that? It's from a site called Learning for Justice. And the name of the article is called Recognizing White Privilege Begins with Truly Understanding the Term Itself by Corey Collins. It's from 2018. So again, it's a little bit older. But I'm going to continue to comment on this article. And I'm doing so because it has so much to do with the educational system that we are up against. This critical race theory, white privilege, um, and all of those terms that go with it that are um, that are, are, are just permeated everything in our, in our society, and it's it's worse in the public schools. So here's another section that that this. Corey talks about, and it's called the power of normal. So part of white privilege is that um, that whites live in a society where the normal is offensive, basically, and demeaning and degrading to people of color. Here are a few of the three of the, the examples that he gives. First aid kit having flesh colored band-aids that only match the skin tone of white people. Products white people need for their hair being in the aisle labeled hair care, rather than a smaller separate section of ethnic hair products. Or the grocery store stocking a variety of food options that reflect the cultural traditions of most white people. And this is, this is the power of normal. So, Everything that this person cites is about the commercial interests of a company, okay? So if you were the manufacturer of Band-Aids and the point of a Band-Aid is to, you know, sort of hide the wound, right? It's not to make it look bigger. Of course, now people don't care. I mean, that was the original purpose of it. Now people get bright pink ones and they get, you know, cute little ones for kids and all kinds of things. If you were to try to match the skin color and make Band-Aids black, you know, darker brown or whatever color you want to call that, um, how many Band-Aids would you sell? If you were to, and, and I, I really couldn't understand what this meant, the products white people need for their hair being in the aisle labeled hair care rather than in a smaller separate section of ethnic hair products. I'm not sure what they mean by that. Do they like to have their own section for hair care or do they not want their own section for hair care? Because the truth is black people, many black people have different needs for their hair. Their hair is not like mine. I can't help that. Neither can the manufacturer of shampoos or hair care products. They can't control the fact that what works for a, a black person's hair is not going to work for my hair. And unfortunately, there are a lot more white people than there are black people. So I guess if you wanna go out of business very quickly, you start manufacturing hair products, just as many hair products for black people's hair as you do for white people's hair, because it's woke and it's fair, and it creates a better power, a more of a, of a equal power of normal for black people. And if you wanna go out of business very quickly, go, that's what you should do, okay? Or the grocery store stocking a variety of food options that reflect the cultural traditions of most white people. Well, every store has to look at what their demographic is. If you, I'm pretty sure, if you build your store in a black neighborhood, more of your products are gonna be what those people eat. If you go to a Walmart in Mexico, you're gonna find a whole bunch of different products that we don't have here in the United States, in Oregon, for instance. And if you go to a Walmart in Russia or in China, which I've been to a Walmart in China, they had an open fish market at the Walmart in China. I've never seen that here. Businesses, Corey, 
want to stay in business. It's this thing. I, I'm not sure if you understand that. But corporations, people just want to sell stuff if that's their business. And so they, they put stuff on the shelves that people will buy. So if a Black person moves into a predominantly white neighborhood or white community, and they go into the store, unfortunately, that store will need to stay in business by putting food on the shelves that most of their customers are going to want. If that doesn't feel normal to you as a Black person and, you, and that offends you or you feel frustrated by that, you should probably talk to some Asians or you know, some Ukrainians or Russians or some Hispanics that also live in that neighborhood who are looking for products that are more culture in, in line with their, their food choices too. And, and they won't find them in that store either. It's really just not about blacks. It's about just what the store needs to do to stay in business. Okay. He goes on, but the root of these problems is often ignored. Okay. Well, what is the root of the problem? These types of examples can be dismissed by white people who might say my hair is curly and requires special product or my family's from Poland. It's hard to find traditional Polish food at the grocery store. This may be true, but the reason he says, even these simple white privileges need to be recognized is that the damage goes beyond the inconvenience of shopping for goods and services. These privileges are symbolic of what we might call the power of normal. If public spaces and goods seem catered to one race and segregate the needs of people of other races into special sections, that indicates something beneath the surface. All that's beneath the surface is the need for people to stay in business. That's, that's all that there is. It's just really that simple, right? White people become more likely, says Corey, to move through the world without an expectation that their needs will be readily met. People of color move through the world knowing their needs are on the margins. Recognizing this means recognizing where gaps exist. Okay, listen. I'm sure that there's plenty of homosexual people who feel the same way. I'm sure that there's in, in any given situation that there's women who feel the same way. I'm sure that there's plenty of atheists who feel the same way. I'm sure there's plenty of overweight people or out of shape people. How about old people? Do you think old people feel marginalized in this society? Yeah, I guarantee that they do. Yeah. The truth is everybody feels marginalized in some way, in some situation, a percentage of the time of their life. Teenagers, that's kind of the way they live all the time. They like always feel marginalized. That's just a part, you know, part of their existence during a certain period of time in their life. They're, they're just marginalized unless they are in with a group of their friends in their favorite store. Otherwise, they're, if, if, they, if they've been told all the time that they need to you know, feel victimized by the world, they're going to they're gonna feel marginalized. It goes on and on, okay? This is not just about Black people. This is just life, okay? Stop worrying about the Band-Aids. What? Okay, stop worrying about hair care products. You know, this is just a symptom of people being, having not enough to do. You know, people just need to get out and read some good self-help books. They need to read about people who had some really bad situations in their lives and how they've overcome it. That's what needs to happen. Because worrying about Band-Aids and hair care products and what kind of food is in the grocery store, because there's some power of normal, Now here's, here's a good one, here's a good comment. The power of normal goes beyond the local CVS, meaning drugstore. White people are also 
more likely to see positive portrayals of people who look like them on the news, on TV shows and in the movies. Really? 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 Because as long as I've been watching TV, there have been a lot of black and other people of color role models on there. In fact, you can hardly turn on the TV at all. You can hardly listen to the radio. You can hardly listen, go, go to the movies. You can hardly watch a sports game without seeing positive role models of people of color. They are the majority. They're the majority at this point. You have more white kids wanting to emulate black basketball players and football players and all kinds of media personalities and entertainment personalities than at any time in history. So please, that is just not even a thing. That's, that's, that's really not a thing, okay? This has negative effects for people of color who are without this privilege, face the consequences, consequences of racial profiling, stereotypes, and lack of compassion for their struggles. And then he cites some examples. White people are less likely to be followed, interrogated, or searched by law enforcement because they look suspicious. I would like to see any proof of this. Can somebody, can somebody prove this? Can you give me the parameters under which police officers without any provocation, because they look suspicious, are profiling blacks, okay? Would that be in a black neighborhood after a robbery with a certain description, okay? Where they have pulled somebody over who was completely innocent, but because they fit, there was a certain set of circumstances they were wrongly searched. It's totally happened. Guess what? It's happened to whites too. It happened to Hispanics. It's happened to every demographic. There are, there are there's very, I, I'm going to make just as, as unprovable a statement as that statement just was. There is very little evidence to show that police officers in today, today, I'm not talking about, you know, Jim Crow, okay, I'm not talking about decades ago, or even a couple of decades ago, that for no reason, they just go around searching black people. Now, you can imagine that a police may be looking at you and wondering, checking your tags or checking your whatever. Maybe that guy does that to everybody. You don't know. Okay, maybe that police officer does that to everybody. Let's go on. White people's skin tone will not be a reason people hesitate to trust their credit or financial responsibility. Where's the proof of this? I, I have another newsflash. Banks like to make money, just like a grocery store. They like to make money. They will loan to you if you can qualify. They are not in the business of not making loans. They're in the business of making loans. If white people are accused of a crime, they are less likely to be presumed guilty, less likely to be sentenced to death, and more likely to be portrayed in a fair, nuanced manner by media outlets. Well, how, how can you prove this? How, how is this a provable statement? Who, who is they are less likely to be presumed guilty? Who is... Who is, have you polled every single person on the planet to find out, you know, look at this white person who's a criminal, look at this black person who's a criminal. Do you think that white person is guilty or do you think the black person is guilty? How can you even substantiate such a statement? Or if they are more likely to be portrayed in a fair nuanced manner by media outlets. Have you polled every, have you, Here's another one. The personal faults or missteps of a white person will likely not be used to later deny opportunities or compassion to people who share their racial identity. How, how can you know that? How is that a noble thing? Has that been studied? Where's the study? <laughs> it's just, these are not noble statements. They're just made up 
presumptions. This privilege is invisible to many white people because it seems reasonable that a person should be extended compassion as they move through the world. It seems logical that a person should have the chance to prove themselves individually before they are judged. It's supposedly an American, it is an American ideal. And just for the record, many black people feel the same exact way about white people. Like they're gonna, they're gonna, they presume things about white people. Many black people presume things about Hispanic people. Many Hispanic people presume things about Asian people. Okay, this is the human condition. How are you gonna, how are you gonna go into everybody's brain and know what they're presuming? How are you gonna change that, even if you could? The, the whole theory of critical race theory is, it makes me crazy. It's not a thing. And, it's, it, and even if it exists, it's not, it's not everybody, it's not systemic. It's just individual to individual or, or family to family. You know, sure, parents teach their kids certain things. It doesn't mean everybody teaches their kids the cert that certain thing or even lives that way, okay? Here's this, con here's this quote, Corey. Corey, what's his name? Corey Collins. For example, programs like New York City's now abandoned stop and frisk policy targeted a disproportionate number of black and Latinx people. People of color, okay, let me just address that. Okay, where is the most crime in a city? Is it in the white suburbs? Okay, is it in the downtown? No, it's it's usually in the black part of town or the or the where a lot of people of color are living in poor conditions. That's just I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just stating a fact statistically. So could that explain why a disproportionate number of black and Latinx people are being stopped by police? Could that could that be possible? Because you have 20% of the crime anywhere outside of an 80, you know, anywhere outside the, the, the poor communities, which are largely, which are largely people of color. And 80%, I'm just throwing out numbers. Okay, I don't have those statistics. I'm not gonna get those statistics. I don't care about those statistics. Everybody knows what we're talking about. A disproportionate number of people are arrested. A disproportionate people are incarcerated. A disproportionate people number of people are being stopped by police, a disproportionate number of people are having run-ins with the law. Across the board, because most of the crime is taking place in a certain location and that's where they are. Could that be? Is this, is this even a thing to discuss? Is this something hard to understand? People of color are more likely to be arrested for drug offenses, despite using at a similar rate to white people. Okay, well, fine. Okay, maybe white people are using at the same rate, but they're not getting into big drug, they're not having, uh, they're not doing crime because of it, right? Just, I'm sure there's just as many, uh, you know, per capita white people smoking pot in any given area, but they're just sitting in their house smoking pot. They're not going out and robbing convenience stores or mugging people or whatever is happening among the black community. I, I know you're going to say that's the most racist thing I've ever heard. I'm not, I'm just saying, yes, I agree. There's probably the same drug use, but there's not the same activity going on during the drug use, obviously. Okay. If, if a person has a run in with the law, that something is going on. You don't have people just, you know, policemen just breaking into everybody, every black person's house as they're drinking or smoking or doing drugs or whatever and just arresting them for no reason. They're out on the street doing something. Something else is going on to prompt that, right? A robbery is happening, a mugging is happening, a rape is happening, a murder is happening. Mm. Here's another comment. For example, the ability to accumulate wealth has long been a white privilege, a privilege created by overt systemic racism in both the public and private sectors. 
In 2014, the Pew Research Center released a report that revealed the median net worth of a white household was $141,900. For Black and Hispanic households, that dropped to 11,000 and 13,700 respectively. The gap is huge and the great equalizers don't narrow it. Research from Brandeis University and demos found that the racial wealth gap is not closed when people of color attend college. The median white person who went to college has 7.2 times more wealth than the median black person who went to college and 3.9 time, 3 times more than the median Latino person who went to college. Nor do they close the gap when they work full time or when they spend less and save more. Okay, this is, this is the caveat. The gap instead relies largely on inheritance wealth passed from one generation to the next. And that wealth often comes in the form of inherited homes with value. When white families are able to accumulate wealth because of their earning power or home value, they are more likely to support their children into early adulthood, helping with expenses such as college education, first cars, first homes. The cycle continues. And this privilege is denied to many families of color, a denial that started with the work of public leaders and property managers, the GI Bill provided white veterans with a magic carpet to the middle class and so forth and so on. Okay. Here's what I'm gonna say about that. None of that is really deniable. That's the truth. Yeah, if you have had a house that has appreciated in value over, you know, if your great great grandfather bought a house and, you know, your great great grandfather sold it and made some money on it or a farm, some land somewhere, and this generational thing happened, I'm, I'm sure that there is possibly something to that. I just, there's not going to, I'm not going to argue with that. Is there some reason, okay, you have to get back to the reason. Is there some reason why people of color could not buy a house or land? Now they're going to say in this article that it was because there were, there was redlining by the federal um, housing administration and ex exclusionary zoning practices in, in city ordinances, which wouldn't back loans to black people or those who lived close to black people. Okay, again, I'm gonna need to see a lot more proof that it was, has until recently, it has been impossible for black people to buy a home or land. I, I'm, I just, I, I'm gonna need to see that, okay? Because when I look at all of the successful people, and now I'm not even talking about, I'm talking about middle-class black people. Uh, let me tell you a, story, a couple of stories from my own, um, from my own background. My brother-in-law, who's 10 years, 11 years older than I am, wanted to be a veterinarian, okay? And back in 19, so it would have been in 72, he applied, he had straight A's in all of the sciences, bright guy. And he applied to veterinary school, a lot of veterinary schools he couldn't get in. And the reason was because of affirmative action. He was told straight up, we can't, we're not accepting white male students. This was back in the early seventies, okay? So he became a teacher and he and my sister struggled financially. And he would have been a great veterinarian and um, they would have had a great life. But they raised six kids on his, te on his teacher salary. And uh, I, they didn't do terrible, but they, they never had a lot. They, they struggled like all teachers do. He took, you know, summer jobs and he was a coach and he did everything he could. He was a great dad and a great teacher. But he didn't get to live the American dream because of affirmative action. Years later, his son, who was like six in the nation in his, um, he was, you know, six in the nation and receiving yards in college as a junior, was looking at the draft, um, was not drafted to the team that he pl played some games in the preseason with because he, he was white. 
he was, there was this, you know, whispered in his ear by uh, one of the coaches. It's if you had different color skin, there'd be no question. You'd be, we'd, we'd pick you up. So <laughs> don't tell me that there's white privilege associated in with these stories. I mean, how can you deny this has been happening for decades? And in the name of giving blacks a leg up and, and trying to help them, do you know why some of those people of color that became veterinarians probably didn't do well as a white veterinarian? Because they didn't deserve to be there. They weren't the best candidates. And they probably got into a profession that was over their head. They were admitted with inferior grades. And they didn't do as well as school, if, even if they finished. But my brother-in-law didn't get to go. He would have finished and he would have done a good, he would have been a great, you know, veterinarian because he prepared himself. These, these equalizing measures that you're talking about in here and, and these problems that you're pointing out in, in an article like this, don't take a whole bunch of stuff into account. Okay, there's reasons that are not systemic to America why blacks have not acquired wealth at the same to the same degree that, that whites have. This is a multi-pronged problem. And secondly, you're taking it's it's comparing apples and oranges, right? It's com it's comparing apples and oranges. You have you have to look at all of the reasons why one family does not succeed in, in owning a home that is going to appreciate and all of the reasons why another family of, of a different race is going to succeed in securing a home. Look, <laughs> you know, my husband and I, we, we spent 14 years, 17, 17 years in one home. When we sold it, we could have put that money that we invested into that home into a savings account and made more money. We, we made no, we, with, with inflation and, and with, you know, taking all factors into account, the improvements that we put in and so forth. We made no money on that house. Okay. There's, it, it, it's sad. <laughs> and, and we, we loved raising our, our kids there, but in the end, it, it wasn't, it, it just wasn't an area that ended up appreciating. It didn't make sense to us either, but sometimes that happens. There's so many factors. This is just a complicated, you can't, you can't throw out a statistic like that and say, well, because more, more whites have more wealth, then it's all unfair for blacks. No, people make their own individual decisions on these things. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they get it wrong, right? There's all kinds of reasons why this could be true. A lot of it is also having to do with whatever professions most blacks go into. What are the choices that they make career-wise? Or do they live off welfare? Do they, do they decide they don't want to get an education? Let's look at those statistics. Let's look at the, you know, it's like the wage gap between men and women. Well, there's no wage gap. The wage gap exists because women choose to go into professions where they make less money, where there's less opportunity for growth. There's less opportunity for upward mobility. It, they go into teaching. They go into secretarial. They choose this into you know dental hygienists and things like that they don't they don't become a dentist you know they don't become a business owner they aren't entrepreneurial as much as men are this is just what's going to happen there's no wage gap stop being teachers if you don't want to you know suffer from a wage gap you can't go from being a teacher to being a principal usually or from being a principal very few do women don't don't pursue that track so the inequalities compound, says Corey Collins. To this day, more than 80% of poor black students attend a high poverty school where suspension rates are often higher and resources are often limited. Once out of school, obstacles remain. Well, of course that's true. That's one of the reasons that I wanna disrupt the public. This, is this, the, is this the, um, the fault of the American government? Well, yeah, it kind of, in this, I will agree with it, yes. We need to do away with, with this one thing. We need to get rid of the public school systems. Yeah, it's gonna be painful. <laughs> but 
But when parents start taking more responsibility for their own children, and they start taking taking uh, direct have a direct involvement in their education, things are going to change. Um, but we need to get there. Now, will that happen? That's up. That's up to the black community. That's up to the Hispanic community. Because the free ride, the free ride that we've gotten with the public school system ever since the 1840s has not proven to be a good thing for people of color. It is, it is disproportionately, as stated here, it has disproportionately harmed people of color. Suspension rates are higher. One set of school the obstacles remain. Economic forgiveness and trust still has racial divides. 17% of white job applicants with a criminal history got a call back, only 5% of blacks get a call back. Okay, there may be many other reasons for that. Qualifications, grade levels, just the way those people present themselves, their preparation, their knowledge of what's going on with the job, right? So here's one last thing that I'll cover. Multiple surveys have shown that many white people support the idea of racial equality, but are less supportive of policies that could make it more possible, such as reparations, affirmative action, or law enforcement reform. Guess what, Corey? We have had affirmative action now, as I mentioned earlier, for decades. In fact, Affirmative action is increasing in this woke age. It's not decreasing. And all of the affirmative action has not lifted a segment of society. And now, now you have people like Ibram X. Kendi saying, that's just white savior stuff. Out of one side of his mouth, he says, we need to change all the policies. Better yet, let's just do away with all the government. Let's do away with capitalism. Capitalism is a construct of white, uh, white society. Religion is a construct of white society. The constitution is a construct of white society. We need to do away with all of that. And basically he's saying all of the power needs to go to people of color and we need to relegate whites to more of a, uh, a position in society that they are subservient to people of color to make atonement and to make sure that their white privilege and their racism cannot be perpetrated anymore on people of color. If you read his book, it's right there. The logical conclusion to believing in white privilege is that to dismantle it, we have to, we have to do away with white society altogether. And if we're going to do that, we're just gonna get rid of the country altogether. So think about that. Mm -hmm.